All right, everyone, we're going we're gonna to start. Um, apologies for the delay. Just wanted to get some images on the screen behind me. Uh, these are shot, excuse me, thank you, from the uh, beginning of uh, book six. Uh, I left off last time with uh, talking about Dido in the Underworld, that famous passage. Unfortunately, you got it as a video. Uh, if you didn't see it, um, let me know and I'll direct you to the lecture. But um, that passage illustrates for Virgil, first of all, it's a famous episode that is mentioned in, in uh, opera, in painting. Um, Augustine mentions it in his Confessions as a passage of significant effect on him. And many people are... Um, uh, misread it and think that we are to uh, be sympathetic towards Dido um, when really I think for Virgil it's illustrating uh, a spiritual threat to Aeneas uh, and his heroism. Now it's not quite on par with the uh, symbolism of the sirens in Odysseus uh, where they represent the lust, just like Circe does, that are, are leading him astray rather than the love which is motivating him throughout his uh, whole passage. But to some degree, she certainly does represent for uh, the Roman Virgil a, not just a distraction, but an opportunity to totally divert Aeneas from his vocation. And his vocation is to found the city of Rome for his son, Eulus. And I mentioned this word, uh, pietas, piety. And I wanted to say something uh, more about piety uh, in this work because I, and wanted to connect it with uh, something we've also discussed in relation to the Greeks. Um, so if you recall what I said when we looked at the, uh, not the Odyssey, but Plato's Republic. Uh, we talked about the way in which Plato orientated his, his uh, listeners towards a sense of justice. He appealed to justice and, and really in a, he's orientating us towards goodness. He says the human life is, is attracted by goodness and we ought to direct ourselves towards goodness. The soul ought to do so. And he used this analogy of the human soul being like a, a city. Remember, it's called uh, in English the Republic, but in Greek it's called the polis. I'm totally on this. Uh, the polis, which, which is a city. And an analogy is made between the individual and the state. And I, I suggested to you that the way in which we should see this is in terms of a microcosm and a macrocosm. So a, a little cosmos and then a great cosmos. And there's an analogy being presented there. Another way of putting it though, and I think you might find this useful, is there is a microcosm, a small little cosmos in, in a person, but then you can flip it around and say that the what we call cosmology is a macroanthropos, a, a big person because it's, they're saying that there's a, a direct analogy between what a human being is and the, the way in which the cosmos has been created. And the Greeks certainly have a sense of cosmic piety. A and Odysseus is fulfilling cosmic piety in the Greek. The whole system of philosophy is living the way the gods intended us to live. That's the whole Greek worldview. They're very religious people. They think everything is, is uh, charged with religious meaning. The gods are in everything. We saw that the downside of that was that they were fatalistic because the gods really don't care about us. But still, it's incumbent upon the Greek heroes to be pious uh, towards the cosmos, the way the gods have created the world at all times. They have to sacrifice to the gods. They have to make sure not to anger the gods. They have to m make sure they ho show hospitality because they might be entertaining a god, etc. So cosmic piety is everywhere and that it imbues everything and everything is uh, everything sacred if you will there's no neutral space the idea of neutrality is a post scientific age idea the idea that the world is just material 
and we can do with it whatever we want. And there's no ethical implications of doing what, whatever we want with it. And that we can do whatever we want with our own bodies. And they're, they're, not, that, uh, they're not under any sort of general um, system of ethics. We ought to follow the wisdom of the ancients and the wisdom of the ages or even scripture on this. There isn't a general rule that applies to all of us. Um, the Greeks and the Romans will categorically disagree with the modern world on this. They think that everything is of religious significance. It's not just a biblical worldview. It's the whole, all of the pagans will likewise think that the world is uh, of religious significance. And so because of this, the soul is, ought to be directed towards what is considered to be just uh, from a cosmic perspective. And Plato wants us to conceive of our city in such terms. The reason I'm saying that is Virgil does as well. Oh, this thing is just going to keep on slipping. I'm not sure what I can do about that. It's gravity. Um, and Virgil's hero, Aeneas, is marked by his piety. And what does this word piety actually mean? It means that it has a couple of attributes to it. First of all, we use this word in, in Christian uh, spirituality as well. We talk about somebody being pious. And we mean religiously devout. They are committed to a certain way of living their lives. Right? And it's a personal, very much of a personal thing. But it's more than just a personal thing. It's something that fits with their um, honoring God, or in this case, the gods. And pious Aeneas is, is pious precisely because he doesn't trust himself. He ends up trusting the gods in fulfilling his obligations. And he, in the end, although he has that little episode with uh, Dido and the attempt, uh, the attempt to, to, first of all, he wants to stay in Troy and just die. But when he leaves there, he lands in Carthage and he wants to stay with, it, with this woman Dido, whom he falls in love with. But in the end, he abandons her. And for Virgil, this is a heroic act. Not because he disparages love, although he probably does do that a little bit, but it's more because he sets aside his self-interest for the sake of his son, Eulus. And in the person of Eulus, his son, who's Julius Caesar's his descendant, and of course, with Julius Caesar, his uh, Augustus Caesar, because Augustus was adopted by Julius Caesar, so there's a, a, a line there, in the person, there's cosmic piety, an individual, because in the person of Eulus is the city of Rome. The city of Rome, just like the Greek polis, is connected to an individual. And so how Aeneas responds to his son is going to, on, on that decision, the whole fate of the, of the future city of Rome is going to depend. So I, I just wanted to connect what I said in Plato, the individual and the state, Virgil's still talking about the same issues. It matters what we do individually on a, on a much larger scale, here in particular, because Aeneas is not just a man like we are, he's a, he's a hero. And uh, his decision will mean the, either the rise of Rome or its non-existence. And if it doesn't exist, then the future will be impoverished for it. You see what I'm talking about here. This is not just any story of a father and a son. We had the story of a father and the son in the, uh, the Odyssey with Telemachus and Odysseus. And it had similar sorts of meanings to it. I didn't get into that there too much. But there is, in the Paideia, the education of little Telemachus, the fate of the city that Odysseus was the king over, Ithaca, was at stake. If Telemachus is not taught to be a just man like his father, uh, Ithaca will fall. The city will fall. And likewise here, uh, he needs to educate his son, but, but first of all, he needs to do what he has to do, which is his grand task in life, which is to found the city of Rome. And doing so is, is called pietas. 
it's a devotion to the gods. It's not just his son, it's to what the gods want. In this case, the gods want, or in fact, it's been fated that Rome will be the grand city that will, will stretch into the future. Does that make sense at least? So I'm tr pulling back, trying to give you a big picture here. And in this, um, most of the Greek period looks back to a better time. It's, it's backward looking. And in Hesiod, which we, whom we haven't read, he has a, a story of, it's called in the, um, in the Theogony, uh, a golden age in the past. Things were better in the, in the Greek understanding and they've become progressively worse. There was a golden age and then there was a rebellion within the gods and it went into a silver age and then into a bronze age and then finally into our age, the iron age. Things were, they used to really be better in, in that account. And it was something that we couldn't recover then. So the Greeks were very fatalistic about it. Things are, are much worse now. We're now in the age of iron when men will war for things. We're not good like we once were. Where are, the, where are all the gods? Well, they were around in the Bronze Age when there were demigods, when there were men that were born of the gods, who the, the age of the heroes. Those, ga those days have gone. There is no more Aeneas. There is no more Odysseus. There is no more Achilles. We're now just surrounded by men, and they're bad. And they're not going to get better. But there's a sense that because they have a cyclical view of history that the Golden Age may still yet come. And I mentioned that in relation to Virgil, that in one of his <coughs> eclogues, he has a prophecy of a coming Golden Age, which to Christians sounded like he was referring to Christ. I'll, I'll come to that when we come to Dante. But, but Virgil in his epic, now here's where there's a difference. He doesn't look backward to a Golden Age. He looks forward to a golden age, because he's in the middle of the Pax Romana. The wars have ceased. Maybe the Iron Age is over. Maybe the new uh, time of the gods before any sense of fallenness uh, was on the earth has returned. We have Augustus Caesar in our midst. And, <coughs> and he sees this as a, uh, a turning point in history. So I mentioned that he made this reference to Homer and his two epics and his one epic and he's outdoing his epic but he's outdoing it also because he thinks that or at least he's suggesting that the golden age may be a turning point in human history when we're returning back to the time where there were no uh, consequences of what we would call the fall and so um, there's a uh, a battle within Aeneas to undo the effects of human history, really. In, the, in that cyclical sense of things getting worse and worse and worse, if he should succeed in his quest, in denying himself, he may found a, an empire that will never uh, fail. Remember, in, with the hindsight of history, we know the Roman Empire did fail, but in Virgil's day, there is a Pax Romana. There are no more wars. Uh, Augustus, Augustus here means the great, by the way, Caesar the Great, uh, claims to be the king of kings and the lord of lords. Does that sound familiar? Directly alluded to by the writers of the Gospels. They say Augustus is the king of kings and the lord of lords. Title of Jesus is the king of kings and lords of lords. What do you think the Christians are suggesting? It's not him who's going to bring about the peace. It's him. He's going to do it through conquest. He's going to do, about, do it through his death. He's going to do it by lording over others. He's going to serve others and die on their behalf. Like the juxtaposition, the contrast could not be bolder and more stark and more explicit. It's explicit. And they won't bow the knee to Caesar, for which they get crucified. Because they say he is not, he is not a god, because there's only one god. So this is a, uh, a patriotic epic, and it, it's extraordinary in that sense that it seems to be ushering forth the, uh, the sort of ideal republic that Plato dreamt of. That's what's being claimed here. In the man, Eulus, the boy, the whole of the city of Rome is 
caught up and the whole cosmos is involved in it. Now I say that because at the, uh, in book six, we're gonna find part of Aeneas's piety is to undergo the very same voyage that we found Odysseus did in book 11 of, of the Odyssey, namely a descent into the underworld. Remember he did this, and this is a feature of epic poetry in the Greco-Roman mold. The hero goes down to the realm of the dead, the shades where no man goes and comes back. Everyone goes down there, but only a very uh, elite few ever come back from it. Uh, Tolkien is alluding to this when Aragorn go, goes down to the paths of the dead and comes back up. Um, Christians would see an analogy here between the descent and the rise to the underworld of what Christ does when he goes down to the underworld and preaches to the captives in prison and so forth. And he comes back up and the resurrection is exactly uh, typified in this idea of a man going down by death and yet rising from it because death can't hold him because he's, he's not a sinner. He bears sin, but he isn't a sinner, so death has no legitimate claim on his life. And he rises up. And in the resurrection life of Jesus, in the one man, the city of God is birthed, the heavenly Jerusalem. Like that's being, it's explicitly being alluded to in scripture, this idea of a man connected to a city and a people and a civilization. Um, so here we go down into the underworld. Now we're gonna find in this descend into the underworld a lot that lo will look familiar because many of the figures that we find in the underworld in Virgil, we've already found in Homer's underworld. They're even the same names, some of the same figures. We find that the personages in the underworld uh, are not just people, but monsters. Cerberus, the hellhound, it's got three heads, three throats. Man remember Harry Potter? I don't know if you like the dog and you, you give it a drug, drug meat and it falls asleep, just pluck that right out of the Aeneid. Um, all sorts of stuff are, are plucked by contemporary authors who've read anything directly from um, classical literature. And, and in this, this case, it is so. But in book six for Virgil, this is not just a descent into the underworld because what, and this is just, I'm setting the stage here. When Virgil portrays Aeneas going down into the underworld, he goes down as a Trojan, as a man who came from the city of Troy. When he comes up from the underworld, he comes up as a Roman. Remember, he's come from the, the he's coming from f the, the f defeated people of Troy. He is, in some sense, weak in some sense, unwilling to do his task, and in some sense, already demonstrated that he's not worthy of the task. Or he has to literally be pushed out of the city of, of Troy, burning. But the gods have to incite him to do so. Uh, he has to be encouraged to leave Dido. He doesn't want to leave her. So as I say, as a hero, he doesn't seem like he has a strong, virtuous character because he gives in to his passions. But in the end, he sets aside his passions and does what is his duty and what the gods have prophesied must happen, what's fated to happen. And that makes him the Roman hero. And his piety is in founding, uh, as I say, not just overcoming death, but founding a city, a city which is an empire. So it's very much forward-looking. In, in Homer's, even in Homer's day, the Odyssey is telling a story that happened in the past. But it doesn't have any effect on the present. For Virgil, it's about, it's about current affairs and history not backwards, but going forwards. This is the way things are gonna be forever because of what Aeneas did. So it's very much an application to the current day. Now we'll find next semester in the second half of this course, when we do Milton's Paradise Lost, he's going to say that his story of the fall of Adam 
And the redemption that comes through Christ is also going to apply not just to the past, but to human history going forward. It will, he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So he will, he will Christianize it. But for now, it's not Christianized, but it is applied to human history. It's a histor of historical significance. Whereas in Homer, it almost sounds like mythology, ancient history. Did this guy ever live? What, you know, what's, it's, it seems rather archaic and irrelevant. Not so here. He's explicitly applying it to Roman history. So when he goes down to the Roman underworld, and I'll, I'll read some extracts from this in a few minutes, he will talk about the various wars between Carthage and Rome and battles that bring about the Roman Republic and eventually lead to the accession of Augustus Caesar to the throne of the emperor. And it's prophesied that there will be peace going forward because of this. We'll look at the funny end to that story. I've already alluded to this already. But that, that's what's at stake when he goes down to the underworld. So it's not just he's going to do something that only heroes do, which is go down and come back up. He's going to bring about an empire as a consequence of this. So it, and this is an act of the gods. It's, it's the gods have prophesied, foreseen, fated that this happened. So it's of huge significance that this happened. So let me read some of the words here from our translation. We have here uh, Sharon here leading people across the uh, river of the underworld. But these were the very words. He wept and said, he lets the rains that curb the fleet fall slack. At last he glides the Euboean coast of Cume. The Trojans turn their prows around to sea. Tenacious teeth, their anchors grip the ships. The curving keels line up. They fringe the beach. A band of keen young men leap toward the land that is Hesperia. Some seek the seeds of fire hidden in the veins of flint. Some scour the forest and the tangled dens of beasts and point to newfound streams. But pious Aeneas seeks the peaks where high Apollo is king, and in a deep, enormous grotto, the awful Sibyl has her secret home. For there the seer of Delos so inspires her mind and soul that she may know the future. And now they come upon Diana's grove, and now they reach the shrine, the roof of gold. So note, he's going down and he's going to speak. Now remember back in the Odyssey, Odysseus went down to the underworld, and who did he meet there? Who is going to lead him in the knowledge? Because he had to consult with a figure. Who was it? Do you recall? Yes, the blind prophet Tiresias, whom we also met in the tragedy, a, a figure of prophecy. Now, he's, he has the wisdom to lead him where he needs to go. Yes, but there's no reference there to what we see here, which is that the Sibyl sees the future. She knows the future. And the Sibyl is presented as uh, being uh, impassioned, overcome by divine uh, wisdom. And she writes it down. And here's the mysterious way in which this is portrayed. The Sibyl in her cave writes on Sibylline leaves the wisdom of the gods. And to her distress, the leaves are blown by a wind. So she loses track of what's happening. But nonetheless, it's about the future. So there's something of a mystery about this. Uh, but it's note that it's future facing, unlike the, the Greek epics, which are telling a, a story of the past that is of significance, but it doesn't really indicate what's going to happen in the future. This one does. But they're in a shrine, a roof of gold. And, and when Daedalus, who's Daedalus, by the way? Does anyone know who Daedalus is? I've never talked yet. Sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, so he, Daedalus is a craftsman, an artisan, uh, a famous craftsman in the ancient world, and he uh, creates a flying machine with feathers held together by wax. The wax holds them together. And his son Icarus gets control of daddy's flying machine, the fool that he is, and flies too close to the sun. As a result of flying too close to the sun, the wax melts and he 
crashes down to the ground. But Daedalus is a famous artisan, craftsman, known for his tech, tech, technical knowledge of things. Uh, so anyway, alluded to here. When Daedalus, for so the tale is told, fled Minos' kingdom on swift wings and dared to trust his body to the sky, he floated along strange ways up toward the frozen north. In disarray, oops, until he gently came to rest upon the mountaintop of Chalcis. Here he was returned to earth, and here he dedicated his oar-like wings to you, Apollo. Here he built a splendid temple in your honor. Upon the gates he carved Androgeus's death, and then the men of Athens, made to pay each year with seven bodies of their sons. Before them stands the urn, the lots are drawn, and facing this he set another scene. And he sets another scene. So what's he doing? He's also depicting in the underworld through his art um, things of cosmic piety and significance. So the artisan, the artist, is also describing things of meaning throughout human history. And what is on the gates? Well, the death. And what's the other scene? The land of Crete, rising out of the sea, the inhuman longing of Pasiphae, the lust that made her mate, the bull by craft, her mongrel son, the two-formed Minotaur, a monument to her polluted passion, and here the inextricable labyrinth. So Daedalus escapes the labyrinth as well. But anyway, um, so all sorts of references to here, and mention of Icarus and so forth. But um, let me skip over that a little bit. The, uh, uh, the uh, Sybil says to Aeneas, line 53, this is no time to gape at spectacles. Far better now to slaughter seven steers drawn from a herd the yoke has never touched, to choose as many sheep as custom asks. And having spoken so, Aeneas's men are quick to sacrifice at her command. She calls the Trojans into that high temple. So they are uh, enacting a propitiation of the gods through a sacrifice. We're going down to the underworld. This is a sacred uh, task that we're about to undertake. Let's make sure the gods are on side. We make a sacrifice, off we go. And they go and uh, as they do this, the Sibyls uh, replies and as the Trojans reached the threshold, 65, the virgin cried, now call upon the fates for oracles. The God is here, the God. And as she says this before the doors, her face and color alter suddenly. Her hair is disarrayed, her breast heaves, and her wild heart swells with frenzy. She is taller now, her voice is more than human, for the power of God is closing in. He breathes upon her. And are you slow to offer vows and prayers, Trojan Aeneas? Are you slow, she shouts, the terrifying house will never open its giant jaws before your vows are spoken. So she becomes enthused. The gods come into her. So the Sibyl is a lot like um, the fates, uh, the fates, the, uh, the muses. So she's, the gods inspire her to, uh, in her activity, but before she is to undertake her activity, Aeneas needs to prepare himself. Are you ready? because you're about to undertake a divine task. And if you are not prepared, you're not going to survive. The Sibyl spoke and then was still. The Trojans' tough bones were shaken by chill shuddering. The king pours prayers from his deepest breast. Phoebus, that is Apollo, you always pitied Troy's hard trials. You guided Dardan spears and Paris's hand against the body of Achilles. You yourself led me along so many seas that bathed broad lands of far Massilian tribesmen. Now all you gods and goddesses who took offense at Troy and at the Dardan's glory can justly spare the sons of Pergamus. And you, most holy priestess, you who know what is to come, I do not ask for any lands that have not been promised by my fates, oh, let the Trojans rest in Latium together with their wandering deities and Troy's tormented gods. Then I shall raise a temple to Apollo and Diana, built out of solid marble and decree, feast days in Phoebus's name. 
Great shrines await you, priestess, too, within our Latin kingdom. For there I shall set up your oracles and secret omens spoken to my people and consecrate to you, generous one, our chosen men. Only do not entrust your verses to the leaves, lest they fly off in disarray the play of rapid winds. Chant them yourself, I pray. His words were ended. Okay, so we have the priestess of Apollo, Phoebus Apollo, the Sibyl. We have Aeneas asking her to pray on his behalf to Apollo. He promises if she does this, he will set up a temple to uh, Apollo and to uh, Diana in, the, uh, in Latium, in, in the Roman Empire, in Italy. If you do this, I will do that. Uh, the promise is made. And then she comes and says, uh, she comes and speaks to them. And, uh, and he says, that, uh, she says this to him, line 173. I think I can skip to that point. Yep. Um, the prophetess began, born of the blood of gods and sons of Troys and Chises. Easy, the way that leads into Avernus. Day and night, the door of dark as dis is open. It's easy to go down to the underworld. You just die. <laughs> There's no, you have no, it's no trouble getting down there. But to, re, but to recall your steps, to rise again into the upper air, that is the labor. That is the task. A few whom Jupiter has loved in kindness or whom blazing worth has raised to heaven as God's sons returned. Through all the central region runs a forest encircled by the black curves of Cocytus. Cocytus is one of the rivers of the underworld. But if your mind is moved by such a love, so great a longing, twice to swim the lake of Styx and twice to see black Tartarus, and you are pleased to try this mad attempt, then Trojan, hear what you must first accomplish. Key point, line, mark it in your text, line 190. A bough is hidden in a shady tree. Its leaves and pliant stem are golden, set aside as sacred to Proserpina. The grove serves as its screen and shades enclose the bough in darkened valleys. Only he may pass beneath earth's secret spaces, who first plucks the golden-leaved fruit of that tree. Lovely Proserpina ordained that this be offered her as a gift. And when the first bough is torn off, a second grows again with leaves of gold, again of that same metal. So let your eyes search overhead, and when the bough is found, then pluck it down by hand, as do. For if the fates have summoned you, the bow will break off freely, easily. But otherwise, no power can overcome it. Hard iron cannot help to, sh to tear it off. And more, the lifeless body of your friend now lies, but you still have power to learn of this, defiling all your fleet with death while you still ask your destiny and linger at our threshold. First, you are to carry him to his own place of rest and burial and bring black cattle as a peace offering. And so at last your eyes shall see the groves of sticks, the lands, the living, never pass. She spoke and then was silent, her lips closed. So let me just stop there for a sec. So he's to go down, and um, that's not a problem. But if he wants to come back up, he first must pluck the leaves of the golden bough. Now this golden bough, I suspect nobody's ever heard of the golden bough. It, it, it is a passage in the Aeneid, which is of huge significance. Um, so much so that an anthropologist by the name of Fraser, Sir James Fraser, I believe it is, in the early 20th century writes a compendium of anthropology. So a, story, a, a study of mythology throughout the world, Africa, South America, North America, Europe, the Far East, and it's called The Golden Bow. That's the name of the book. And it, it's a study in pagan religion tree worship, sac sacred oaks, and so forth. Uh, what we have here is paganism and a sort of a secret ritual of gaining immortality through the golden bough of this uh, tree. And note that it 
conveys a power to do what is naturally impossible, which is to rise from the dead. But it will only work if it is fated. Note the connection to fate once again. It's not his virtue that's going to get him down there. It's not his um, excellence of character. It's not his courage. It's not his bravery. It's if it's fated, if the gods want you to go down, then you will be able to. Otherwise, there's no chance that you can ever pluck this from the tree. Even your sword will not cut it off. Iron will not do it. So if you want to bring about the golden age, it has to be fated. You can't do it through arms. You can't do it through iron. That's the symbolism there. Iron will not cut this golden bow off. It will have to fall into your hand. The gods will have to fate. Uh, will, fate will bring the circle from the golden to the silver to the bronze to the iron age to an end and we'll be back in a golden age. So if it's fated that it be so, it will be so. And so as again I say it's part of the divine plan that Aeneas found the Roman Empire which is going to bring about the will of the gods going forward. That's what's being symbolized here. Does it make sense at least? More or less. Okay, and as I say, Fraser writes his compendium of this and talks about things like tree worship and the sacred oaks and, and rituals connected to New Year's and, and so forth and, and lunar cycles and all that to this same sort of belief in how do we propitiate the gods and bring about a golden age? How do we bring about a harvest every fall? How do we make sure that the crops rise in the spring? Well, we, we commit to certain rituals. That keeps the, the cycle of, of gold, silver, bronze, iron, in, in the four seasons, but we're, now we're not talking about seasons of the year, we're talking about uh, periods of human history. This is a very different thing. A question or a comment? The mention of plucking the golden bough has nothing to do with virtue or anything like Or strength. Or strength. Reminds me a little bit of King Arthur plucking yes. the stone. Yes. Not really, nor even his strength. The strongest man cannot pull the sword out. Yes, and so the Arthurian legend is probably a Christianized version of the same sort of concept, yes. Yeah. That, that's a good comment. I think it's also correct because, again, if, and if he can, what's he going to bring about? A golden age, the Knights of the Round Table, where there is a unity there, there's the, you know, King Arthur is the first among equals, but there's inequality. They share power. These are men committed to an ideal and to upholding a idyllic city of God in the midst of this terrible world through the dint of their chivalry and their devotion to piety. That will keep King Arthur's kingdom from falling. As we know, it does fall because of treachery within the company. Lancelot, the first knight, sleeps with the king's wife. It all comes tumbling down. You're right, the, the echoes are clear there. And, but the idea of a golden age coming is also there. But there's a difference there. Because in the Greek and Roman conception, history is cyclical. So even if you, and this is, and Virgil's well aware of this. Yes, even if we are in a golden age, guess what? The cycle doesn't stop. So you might bring a golden age around for a while, but it will not stay. And I said that there was, a, there was two ways to read this epic. One, he's prophesying a golden age to come. And two, he's saying the golden age is not going to last. Because why? Because of your character. You cannot keep it golden. Because in the Roman people, there is a devotion to Venus. And Venus is committed to not the best things, not divine love but the goddess of love in some ways. And that's fickle and that's changing. It's, it's not faithful. And the Roman people will not be able to keep their empire. So there's a, a, a dual side to that. That's the, that's the pagan view of history. It's cyclical, it recurs, the eternal recurrence as Nietzsche calls it. The Christian view of history is that it has a fixed beginning and it will have a, a conclusion, and all of history is going in that direction, an eschatological end. There will be a, a, a goal to human history, and everything is leaning towards it. The whole of creation 
longs for the redemption visited upon the sons of God. All of the, it's like it's waiting birth. And we human beings who uh, repent and have faith in Christ are being brought into that kingdom which will never fade away. It won't perish. When it comes, it will not be undone. There's no return to a fall. All sin, all iniquity, every tear will be wiped. There will be no more death or crying or pain, right? Right at the end of the book of Revelation. A very different view of history. It has a purpose, it has a fixed beginning, it has a fixed end. And at the end of it, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, and there'll be no more sin or dying or death or, or pain, any of that. It's all gone. Not so here. It's done by force of arms. And uh, the view of history is cyclical and, and recurrent. Can't can't break it. And that's a fatalistic view of the world. But I, I'll talk more about that. It's just a comment as a, from a Christian point of view. But the Christian tradition, King Arthur, is leaning on this for sure. Anyway, um, Aeneas, uh, let me pick it back up, to line 216. Aeneas, sad and staring, takes his way. He leaves the cavern thinking on the strange events. And at his side, the same concerns disturb the true Achates as he goes. Their talk is long and varied as they walk. Of what dead comrade did the priestess speak? What body did she mean for them to bury? But when they reach the shore again, they see Mycenaeus on the dry beach, beaten by a death he did not merit. Mycenaeus, son of Aeolus, a man no one surpassed in waking warriors with his trumpet blast, in kindling with his clang the god of war, for he had been a comrade of great Hector and famous for his clarion and spear. With Hector he had hurried into battle. But when Achilles, victor, stripped his leader of life, Mycenaeus joined himself to Dardan Aeneas, following no lesser banner. And then he fell to madness, happening to make the waves ring with his hollow shell. Blaring, he challenges the god to contest and jealous Triton, if the tale can be believed, snatched up Mycenaeus, dashing him in foaming shoals and breakers, and now around him all mourned aloud. So they have a comrade who has fallen and they've not yet buried him. And the Romans bury their dead. And if you don't bury your dead, you're not honoring the gods. There's, a, there's a, an act of impiety here. You have to bury him first before you're going to be allowed to undergo this sacred task. Yeah, same sort of passage, by the way, in, a dis in the Odyssey. A comrade's fallen off the roof, he's died, they gotta go back and bury him before they can go forward. Now around him all mourned aloud, especially the pious Aeneas, then they rushed to carry out in tears the Sibyl's orders, strived to heap an altar for his tomb, to build it high to heaven, searching through the ancient forest, deep dens of animals. And he gets to it. And they um, consult the birds for omens. And on they go. 271. But when they have reached the, the jaws of foul Avernus, there they rise and swiftly glide along the liquid air. They settle, twins on their desired treetop. The gleam of gold was different, flickering across the boughs. Now comes the epic simile. As in the winter's cold, among the woods the mistletoe, no seed of where it grows, is green with new leaves, girding the tapering stems with yellow fruit. Just so the golden leaves seemed against the dark green ilex. So in the gentle wind the thin gold leaf was crackling. And at once Aeneas plucks it and eager breaks the hesitating bow and carries it into the Sibyl's house. Note for yourself, and this is a little interesting. It says it's supposed to come into your hand. You your, it sort of falls in. He grabs it and breaks it off with force. He's not supposed to be able to do that. Now it's, his, it's, it's, a, it's a slight sign that he's not the man of the fates. He is in one sense because it couldn't have happened if he didn't. Uh, it wasn't faded, but on the other hand, he actually tries to break it. So there is something of the Roman uh, taking the fates for their own selves. So there's a little bit of an aggressive act here. 
obviously faded nonetheless. So he ha now has the golden bow. And now what's he going to do with the golden bow? Well, he's going to show it to Sharon, who will take him across the water into the realm of the, uh, the, realm of the dead. Um, and he will give it to Hecate, if I'm not wrong. So let me see here. Line 324. The priestess places first four black steers uh, and pours new wine on their brows, plucks the topmost hairs from their horns, and these casts on the sacred fires as offering, calling aloud on Hecate, sorry, the queen of heaven and of hell. Hecate mentioned in Shakespeare's Macbeth, later associated with Satan. Um, but here with just um, um, a demon of the underworld. Sorry, the demon's probably a Christianized term here, but uh, the, the patristic era thought that the, the gods that were worshiped by the pagans were demons in disguise. Anyway, offering up to Hecate, the queen of heaven and hell, the other slit the victim's throats and catch warm blood in the bowls as Aeneas sacrifices with his sword a black fleeced lamb for night, the Furies' mother, and Terra, her great sister, and for you, Proserpina, he kills a barren heifer. Note that the rituals here are very dark and um, sinister. And then for Pluto, king of Styx, he raises nocturnal altars, laying on their fires whole carcasses of bulls. He pours fat oil across the burning entrails, but no sooner are dawn and brightness of the early sun upon them than the ground roars underfoot and wooded ridges shudder through the shadows. Dogs seem to howl as Hecate draws near. Away, away, you uninitiated, the priestess shrieks. Now leave the grove, only Aeneas move ahead. Unsheathe your sword. You need your courage now, you need your heart. This said, she plunges wild into the open cavern but with unfaltering steps, Aeneas keeps pace beside his guide as she advances. And then there's an invocation here by Virgil. I'll just skip over it. But you gods who hold dominion. So he directs his uh, voice to the gods here. Uh, Let us through. And on they go and they see various things. Now what I want you to know in the figures, I mentioned there are some figures that are in common. In Virgil's underworld, we will find there are things that are uncommon with that, of, um, with that of Homer, namely that he starts to allegorize. So in the underworld, what do we find? We find grief, line 364, and cares, and diseases, and old age, and fear, and hunger, that worst counselor, and ugly poverty, and death and trials and death's brother sleep and all the evil pleasures of the mind and war. So allegorized forms of ways of coming down to the underworld, various forms, but presented in a metaphysical way. So uh, Virgil's more of a philosophic poet than Homer in the sense that he's giving uh, th senses of things that lead to death uh, and setting them in the underworld. We didn't find that in Homer. But down, sh down they go and they see other things. Um, we see Shimmera, armed with flames, Gorgons and Harpies, line 381, Geryon, the shade that wears three bodies, and here Aeneas, shaken suddenly by terror, grips his sword. He offers naked steel and opposes those who come. Had not his wise companion warned him they were only thin lives that glide without a body in the hollow semblance of a form, he would in vain have torn the shadows with his blade. So in the underworld, there are shades, and the shades have no physical form. They look like they have bodies, but they, there's nothing there. This is the life after death. It's a shade. They're called shades. In uh, the Old Testament, uh, it's called shale. It's the underworld, and there's a sense of a shadowy existence there. It's not quite the same, but there's some forms of correspondence. But here, line 390 starts the pathway to the waters of Tartarian Asheron. This is one of the rivers in the underworld, the Asheron. 
I think there's a new movie about that. Asheron? Am I imagining that? I might be. Anyway, uh, a whirlpool thick with sludge, its giant eddy seething, vomits all of its swirling sand into Cocytus, another river. Grim Sharon is the squalid ferryman, the guardian of these streams, these rivers. His white hairs lie thick, disheveled on his chin. His eyes are fires that stare. A filthy mantle hangs down his shoulder by a knot. Alone he pulls the boat and tends the sails and carries the dead in his dark ship, old as he is, but old age in a god is tough and green. Now, Sharon, it, when the Romans die, if they want to get the dead into the other, to the other side, they have to put gold sovereigns on the eyes of the dead. And Sharon takes the gold from their eyes and gives them passage. That's how you get from, uh, from the shores of the underworld into the underworld, and until then you're tormented. So Sharon is portrayed as, he's the ferryman that takes you into the underworld. Uh, presented as a, a god of sort, but not a particularly good god. He's just immortal. And here a multitude was rushing, swarming shoreward with men and mothers, bodies of high-hearted heroes stripped of life, and boys and unwed girls, and young men set upon the pyre of death before their father's eyes, thick as the leaves that with the early frost of autumn drop and fall within the forest, or as the birds that flock along the beaches, in flight from frenzied seas when the chill season drives them across the waves to lands of sun. Easy to imagine here in Canada. The leaves fall, the birds flock, they're getting out of here. That's what the underworld is presented as. It's the time of, we're going from autumn to winter. And this is the place of winter. They, the souls are there and they're heaped up like leaves on the ground, so high or like birds in the air, and they stand and each pleads to be the first to cross the stream. Their hands reach out in longing for the farther shore, but Sharon, sulling boatman, now takes these souls, now those. The rest he leaves, thrusting them back. He keeps them from the beach. The disarray dismays and moves Aeneas. O virgin, what does all this swarming mean? What do these spirits plead, and by what rule must some keep off the bank while others sweep the blue black waters with their oars? The words the aged priest, priestess speaks are brief. Why is he asked the question? He wants to understand the nature of what happens after death. He has no idea. He's a man. Who will acquaint him with this? They seem to be in torment. The soul, when they, all these, they're heroes, they're bad, it doesn't matter who they are. They're in torment. They want to get over there. He won't even let them get across. How come? The words the aged priestess speaks are brief. Anchises, son, certain offspring of the gods, you see the deep pools of Cocytus and the marsh of Styx, by whose divinity even the high ones are afraid to swear falsely. Note that in the pagan world, if you want to proclaim the highest oath, you don't swear by the gods above, you swear by the underworld. So again, further signs demonic. They swear by what's beneath, the power that binds life to death. They swear by death. Rather than the Lord of life, they swear by death. Faded for all. Um, all these you see are helpless and unburied. There's the problem. The ferryman is Sharon, and the waves will only carry souls that have a tomb. Before his bones have found their rest, no one may cross the horrid shores and the horse waters. They wander for a hundred years and hover about these banks until they gain their entry to visit once again the pools they long for. And Kaisi's son has stopped. He stays his steps and ponders, pitying these unkind fate. So how do the Romans treat their dead? They bury them. They give them a burial. So do the Greeks, actually, which is why when Achilles kills Hector, and desecrates his body by dragging it around the chariot, this is an impious act. It makes the gods outraged. He's, he's setting himself above the gods. He's committing an impious act in his rage. And the father has to, he has to come to him and plead for his son's body in the midst of the Greek camp. 
and Achilles is so moved by the father's uh, bravery and devotion to his son, even like he's crept into the Greek camp at the cost of his own, at the, the threat of his own life, the king, because the war is over. But he comes for his son's body, he gives it to him. You're a better man than I am. Respect. Anyway, uh, on he goes and he finds Palinaris and how he ended up down there. But let me move ahead there. Um, as he goes up towards uh, Sharon, Sharon says, stop right there. You're not coming down. 511, enough, stop there. Whoever you may be who make your way, so armed down to our waters, tell me now why you have come. This is the land of shadows, of sleep and drowsy night. No living bodies can take their passage in the ship of Styx. Indeed, I was not glad to have Alcides or Theseus or Pirithous cross the lake, though the three of them were sons of gods and undefeated in their wars. Alcides tried to drag off in chains the guardian of Tartarus. He tore him, trembling from the king's own throne. The others tried to carry the queen away from Pluto's wedding chamber. Apollo's priestess answered briefly, we bring no such trickery. We need to be, no need to be disturbed. Our weapons bear no violence. For us, the mighty watchman can bark on forever in his cavern, frightening the bloodless shades. Proserpina can keep the threshold of her uncle faithfully. Trojan Aeneas, famed for piety and arms, descends to meet his father down into the deepest shades of Erebus. And if the image, Erebus is a, is a word used for the underworld or Pluto or hell, later called hell. Erebus comes up over and over, I just mentioned it. And if the image of such piety is not enough to move you then, and here she shows the branch beneath, concealed beneath her robe, you may recognize this bow. Aha, the golden bow. At this, the swollen heart of Sharon stills its anger. He says no more. He wonders at the sacred gift of the destined wand, so long unseen and turns his blue-black keel towards shore. He clears the other spirits from the gangways and long benches and meanwhile admits the mass of Aeneas to the boat. Why massive? Because he's not a shade. <laughs> he almost sinks the boat. It goes down so far. He's got, he's got a body. The vessel seems groaning beneath the weight as they let in marsh water through the chinks. At last he sets the priestess and soldiers safe across the stream in ugly slime and blue gray, gray sledge. And then they meet Cerberus, line 551. And they give him a little bit of drugged meat and so forth. And then they go on. And who do they meet down in the underworld? Who other than 593, a woman? And who is she? Her wound still fresh, Phoenician Dido. He meets Dido. We le he left her off in uh, book four. Her city in flames. He leaving the shore. He has no idea what's going to happen to her. He, he has no idea. He can't care. He has to do his duty. He has to forget Dido. He does forget her, but he doesn't forget her. He, he still mourns and longs to be with her, but he does his duty. He is pious towards uh, his son and towards his father and towards his people. But he sees Dido, and when the Trojan hero recognized her, dim shape among the shadows, just as one who either sees or thinks he sees among the cloud banks, when the mouth, month is young, the moon rising, he wept and said with tender love, unhappy Dido, then the word I had was true, that you were dead, that you pursued your final moment with the sword? Did I bring only death to you? Queen, I swear by the stars, the gods above, and any trust that may be in this underneath, I was unwilling when I had to leave your shores. But those same orders of the gods that now urge on my journey through the shadows, through abandoned thorny lands and deepest night, drove me by their decrees. And I could not believe that with my going I would bring so grief, 
great a grief as this. But stay your steps. Do not retreat from me. Whom do you flee? This is the last time fate will let us speak. These were the words Aeneas, weeping, used, trying to soothe the burning, fierce-eyed shade. She turned away, eyes to the ground, her face no more moved by his speech than if she stood as stubborn flint or some marpesson crag. At last she tore herself away, she fled, and still his enemy into the forest of shadows where Sicius, once her husband answered her sorrows, gives her love for love. Nevertheless, Aeneas, stunned by her unkindly fate, still falls at a distance with tears and pity for her as she goes. So, don't get a woman angry. She stays angry, and it's not going to go away. It will be angry even after death. Um, no, that's not the lesson. Dido represents a certain type of attitude uh, that Aeneas is himself subject to. She indulged her own uh, desires. She didn't seek the good of her people first. She was willing to let the city of Carthage not be constructed. She was willing to set aside that for their, their study in contrast. Aeneas is praised for leaving her. We're not supposed to pity Dido. We're supposed to rec identify with Dido in a sense, but we're supposed to see that side of ourselves and repudiate it. I will not be set aside from true piety towards the gods by earthly connections. And in this, Aeneas presents himself as a Stoic hero. You have to uh, basically mortify your own desires. Everything that your flesh longs for, ignore that and do what's right. Stiff up her lip and, and note that he's not a very good Stoic. Virgil's a Stoic. Aeneas is not a very good Stoic, but he still does his duty. And so in that sense, he is a hero for us. So where, where she, as I say, is a study in contrast, she uh, remains committed to her selfish desires, and this is what we ought not to be like. So for Virgil, she's a very bad woman. Not just because she's the enemy of Rome, but because she's the enemy of what's good, what the God's will is. That's what she's an uh, opponent to. Does that make sense, at least? Okay. Anyway, uh, on they go. He sees the son of Priam, um, who was uh, his king back when Troy was there. Um, and he moves onwards to Siphony. He sees great punishments. Oh, by the way, in the underworld here, unlike in Homer, there are, are, there are different paths. There's a path that goes down to the punishment of the wicked. There's a sort of a differentiation of punishment. In Homer, there doesn't seem to be quite the same thing. The good and the bad are in the same place, more or less, in the underworld. I mean, there's slight, but here it's, it's very different. Uh, the, the bad characters here go down to Tantalus, and they're punished for the injustices they've committed. The good go to the Elysian fields. You've heard of the Champs-Élysées in Paris. That's the Elysian fields. It's the realm of the blessed. It's presented there in the city of Paris, but um, a direct reference to, to Virgil here. And this is where the blessed go. I guess Paris is where the blessed go. I don't know. I mean, the food's pretty good. I'm not sure about quite uh, being the heavenly city, but anyway, you might disagree. Um, certainly better than Toronto, but never mind. Um, but crimes are punished here. So this is interesting. There is justice here after life in a way that there was not in Homer. In Homer, remember, he meets Achilles and Achilles is unhappy to even be there. Wishes that he had spent his life on earth as a servant rather than come down early here. Not so here. Here we have injustices punished. So there's a sense of greater justice after life here. Uh, so it's more it's, it's following Homer, but it's, it's differentiated, and justice seems to be more a part of it. And I mentioned the allegories already there as well. But he says, what is this? And the Sibyl explains to him, line 743, 
great captain of the Teucrians, no innocent can cross these cursed thresholds. But when the goddess Hecate made me the guardian of Avernus's groves, then she revealed the penalties the gods decreed and guided me through the halls of hell. The king of these harsh realms is Radamanthus, the Gnosian. He hears men's crimes and then chastises and compels confession for those guilts that anyone rejoicing hid. Hypocrisy gets found out here by Radamanthus, who's presented as a judge in the underworld. Don't remember the name. We'll meet him in Dante again. But he's a sort of a judge in the underworld, and he punishes people in accordance with uh, injustices that were not seen in life, but the gods have seen them. Um, uh, rejoicing hid but uselessly within the world above, delaying t his atonement till too late, beyond the time of death. Tisiphone is at, at once is the avenger armed with whips. She leaps upon the guilty, lashing them. In her left hand, she grips her gruesome vipers and calls her savage company of sisters. And now at last, the sacred doors are open, their hinges grating horribly. You see what kind of sentry stands before the entrance. What shape is the, at the threshold? Fiercer still, the monstrous hydra lives inside. Her 50 black mouths are gaping. Tartarus herself then plunges downwards, stretching twice as far as she is, the view of heaven. So this is a place of justice. Even if in life you were not caught in your injustice, you will be caught in the underworld. The gods will have, have seen this. You may have escaped justice, but you will not escape it in the world after. So this is Virgil giving a very uh, just portrait of, of metaphysics or what happens after life. Yes? Where was that idea of It's certainly not present in the Greek. It's not. No, no. It's a Roman idea of, the, and probably a Stoic idea, that law um, is part of the cosmos, is imbued in the whole tapestry of life. So in Romans 1, scripture, it talks about the pagans knowing that there is a creator, uh, knowing that uh, and all things were made by him, and they, they know what's right and wrong, and therefore they're without excuse. And they suppress the truth and unrighteousness, says Paul. But he's commenting on his letter to the Romans on how the, even the Romans know that there's a justice. Justice is a part of the divine fabric. There's no getting away from it. You're not going to get the view that is presented by Thrasymachus that might makes right. The Romans aren't having any of that stuff. No, 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 no. The universe is totally just, and there will be punishment for injustice. The Romans know it. It's just they don't acknowledge God for who he is, and therefore they themselves are unjust. They need to repent, and they haven't done that. Uh, they worship a man, Augustus Caesar, the Lord of Lords and gods of gods, as he claims of himself. So they have that, that sense. I don't know. It seems to be a Roman thing. I don't know if it's in other ancient peoples, but it's certainly there in the Romans. Strong sense of that. Um, so on they go. Um, so that was Tartarus in line 715, still in the ramparts of Great Dis. Dis is a city in the underworld. There is a highway to Elysium, the Champs d'Elysees, the, the place, the Elysian fields. The wicked are punished on the left. That path leads down to godless Tartarus, whereas this way to the right leads to Elysium. So in the underworld, all go down to the underworld. They don't go to heaven, they go down. But there, there's a differentiation. The just have a, a slightly better fate. But there's no escaping it. And it's, a, again, a shadowy existence. But they're not punished in the underworld. They're just deprived of goodness. But here we have a sense that the, the wicked are punished. Um, so Rhadamanthus. Uh, and then there's a vulture, Titus. I'll skip over these things. Theseus has to sit forever. Um, and then they come to the groves of blessedness. I'm not going to go through this, but look at line 847 and onwards. They have gymnasiums and stuff like that. And they compete in, in uh, like uh, Olympic-type games, the heroes 
there in the underworld. And there we find Orpheus, Orpheus playing his lyre with its seven tones. And so there's a sort of a, a music and beauty there in the Elysian fields. And uh, then he sees others. And who does he see? And uh, he wants to, first he needs to meet his father. And what does his father, he say to his father? Uh, 919. My father, it was your sad image so often come that urged me to these thresholds. My ships are moored to the Tyrrhenian. O oh, father, let me hold your right hand fast. Do not withdraw from my embrace. So he does the firm right hand where you grasp his forearm and he grasps your forearm. His face was wet with weeping as he spoke. Three times he tried to throw his arms around in Kaisi's neck and three times the shade escaped from that vain clasp like light winds or most like swift dreams. That, this passage of embracing, you will find comes over and over and over in Western literature. Like the Aeneid is read by everybody and they refer back to it. And this embracing, trying to embrace his dead father and he can't do it because he's a shade, will recur. Anyway, meanwhile, Aeneas in its secret valley can see a shelter grove and down he goes. And he asks his father a question, line 947. Father, can it be that any souls would ever leave their dwelling here to go beneath the sky of earth and once again take on their sluggish bodies? Are they madmen? Why this wild longing for the light of earth? Son, you will have the answer. I shall not keep you in doubt. And Kaisi starts and then reveals to him each single thing in order. First, know a soul within sustains the heaven and earth. Microcosm. A soul within contains all that. The plains of water, the gleaming globe of the moon, the titan sun, the stars, and mine that pours through every member mingles with that great body. Born of these, the race of men and cattle, flying things, and all the monsters that the sea has bred beneath its glassy surface. Fiery energy is in these seeds. Their source is heavenly. And they are dulled by harmful bodies, blunted by their own earthly limbs. They're mortal members. What he is giving us here a portrait of is a Gnostic view of human nature. The soul is good, the body evil in some sense. And the aim of life is to escape the body. The Stoic Virgil is uh, teaching us to um, see our bodies as our enemies. It's a prison house. It makes you do what you want, don't want to do. Do the spiritual thing, don't do the bodily thing goes against Christian teaching insofar as the body is seen as the temple of the Lord. And Christ himself bears a human body. But anyway, um, when the final day of life deserts them, 970, then, even then, not every ill, not all the plagues of body quit them utterly. And this must be, for taints so long congealed cling fast in deep and extraordinary ways. Therefore, they are schooled by punishment and pay with torments for their old misdeeds. Some there are purified by air, suspended and stretched before the empty winds. For some the stain of guilt is washed away beneath, a mighty whirlpool or consumed by fire. First each of us must suffer his own shade. Then we are sent through wide Elysium. A few of us will gain the fields of gladness until the finished cycle of the ages with lapse of days and nulls the ancient stain and leaves the power of ether pure in us, the fire of spirit simple and unsoiled. But all the rest, when they have passed time circle for a millennium, are summoned by a god to Lethe in great assembly that free of memory they may return beneath the curve of the upper world where they may again begin to wish for bodies. So what happens to some of them are purified through this and uh, are divinized. But most will be reincarnated. After a, a millennium, a thousand years, they will be dipped in the river Lethe where, where they will forget their identity. They will lose their identity and then they get born in another body. And if they were wicked, it, they'll be in a worse state. And if they were good, they'll be in a better state. And there's a sense of progress then, um, or regress, depending on how you've acted in your body in life. So hence, be, be good in this life, so you get reincarnated as something better than you were. The pagan idea of reincarnation is ubiquitous, but it's a pagan idea. Note that they don't bear the image of God, people. 
it, their individuality doesn't matter. Their group identity does. And, and they can be reborn as somebody else, etc. Again, Virgil leaning into very modern, we would say, uh, gosh, I haven't gone on as far as I want to. What, do I, what time do I have here? 2.05. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick this up next time to the conclusion of this uh, story, I want to talk about a, a bit about the vision he sees for the future and then talk about his departure from this. Remember I said he goes down in the underworld as a, as a Trojan, he comes up as a Roman. He's a very different man when he comes up because the vision that he's given is uh, not of defeat but of victory because he sees what will come in the future in his great uh, ancestor, Augustus Caesar. I'll leave it off for now though.